Good morning. My name is Scott Bird. I'm the uh, youth pastor here, one of the elders. I'll be leading us through worship this morning. Um, we're glad that you're here this morning. Uh, if you, or we, we like to say, you've probably heard this a thousand times, we like to say that our church, we want it to be a place that proclaims a hope in the gospel. Uh, we want it to be a place that builds a home for those people who found hope in the gospel. And we want to launch a healing into our community and around the world. Look, if you want to be a part of that, if you want to help, I would encourage you to look at the back of your bulletin on the inside flap. There's some ways that you can serve. Uh, this page right here. Look that over, see if you can uh, jump in where we need you. Uh, we would appreciate that. But we have a lot going on at our church. Things are starting to slow down a little bit, but we still got several uh, things going on. So first, we've got Bring Your Own Baby. Uh, bring Your Own Baby. We've got two more of these. So if you have a, a baby or a toddler, uh, we encourage you to come on May 3rd and May 10th from 9 to 11. Uh, you'll actually be painting some, some flower pots for that. Uh, this, is, this really serves to kind of build some community among women and among the children uh, just kind of during the week. So we'd encourage you to come to that. Uh, we also, college students, we're turning our church into a coffee shop, kind of. Uh, I know during finals week, coffee shops are packed. Uh, we want y'all to come here or feel free to come here and study uh, during, during the week from 10 to 4 every day from Monday to Thursday. We'll be open. We'll have coffee. We'll have some snacks. And the coffee is actually from Heartbreak Coffee over there. So it's, it's pretty good coffee, not your average church coffee. Um, so, so college students, come make this your home. Enjoy the, the free Wi-Fi, the coffee, the snacks. This morning, we have an awesome service. Uh, we get to experience both sacraments. We get to see communicants join. We get to hear a sermon from Romans 8, one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. Um, Les is going to be preaching on our security in Christ. And so let's stand as we prepare to worship this Savior. Our call to worship comes from Psalm chapter 56. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? This, this I know, that God is for me, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must, must perform, perform my vows to you, O God. God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of life. Let's continue standing and sing our hymn of praise.
Let's pray. Lord, we just read in your word that you are for your people. It's such a comfort to know that because of Christ, you're on our side. We're no longer your enemies, but we're brought into your family and called your children. You are all powerful, working all things for our good, even when we doubt you and when we think we know better. Lord, you are faithful to unfaithful people. You hold us tight even when we would try to squirm out of your hands. Your promises are more sure than the sun rising tomorrow. Lord, thank you for being our rock, unchanging, steadfast, and immovable. We pray this morning that you would use your word, the hymns, and the sacraments in which we partake to strengthen our faith and grow our love for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On this Lord's Day, we join Christians from all over the world, all denominations, uh, all languages, nationalities, races. We join them in praising our Savior. And what, what unites us is what we believe about who God is and what he's done for us. And the Nicene Creed is a creed from the fourth century uh, that really summarizes who God is and what he's done. So let's affirm our faith together by reading the Nicene Creed. We, we believe in one, one God, God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Praise God be seated. You know, too often we're dishonest with ourselves about who we really are. We're dishonest with others about who we really are. We tend to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. Well, before God, we are completely exposed. He knows our true selves because they're revealed. Well, Isaiah this morning in our call to confession shows us who we really are. The call to confession comes from Isaiah chapter 30. It says, Write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it in a book that it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. For they are a rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, Do not see, and to the prophets, Do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things, prophesy illusions. Leave the way, turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. 
For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling. Let's read our corporate confession of sin together. Lord, you are good when you give, when you take away, when the sun shines upon me, when night gathers over me. You have loved me before the foundation of the world, and in love did redeem my soul, and love me still in spite of my hard heart, ingratitude, distrust. Your grace has been with me, leading me through a twisting wilderness, in retreat, helping me to advance when beaten back, making sure headway. Your goodness will be with me in days ahead. If you have appointed storms of tribulation, you will be with me in them. If I have to pass through tempests of temptation, I will not drown. Only glorify yourself in me, whether in comfort or trial, as a chosen vessel prepared always for your use. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in silent confession. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now look up and stand up and hear the assurance of pardon through Christ from Isaiah chapter 30. The Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. For a people shall dwell in Zion, in Jerusalem, you shall weep no more. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. As soon as he hears it, he answers you. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide himself any more. But your eyes shall see your teacher, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. What can separate us from the love of God, he who gave up his own son for us? Uh, we introduced a song a couple weeks ago, and we invite you to uh, sing together with us now as we rejoice that uh, if God is for us, who can be against us? So let's sing together.
If I could go ahead and have all the elders present come up and just stand back along this wall here. Um, we are going to get to do something uh, really exciting. Uh, one of my favorite things in the church is to see communicant members, uh, people who have formerly been uh, covenant members, come and join the church in full standing. And this is Elizabeth Adrian, our children's director. She's going to be handing out our Bibles this morning, which I need to get. All right, communicants, in just a second, I'll call you up, and you can come just stand right in front of the elders over here. All right, Keaton Elizabeth Chambly, would you come up? Conley Pillow Clark, you can come on up. Ava Montgomery Cross. Grafton Lee Graber. And y'all can come grab a Bible over here, I'm sorry. James David Graber. Price Acre Graber. Nathaniel Hom. George Martin Levy. Chapel Rose Maxey. All right, all these guys and girls have been through the uh, communicants class, which is a five-week class that goes through the five membership questions that we're going to ask in just a little bit. Um, and they're coming up here to make a public profession of their faith in Christ. And when they do that, they join the church. When they join the church, they get all the privileges and blessings of being a full member of the church. And part of that is that they have you, church, to encourage them in their Christian walk to challenge them, to call them out when they aren't following these vows that they've committed to, to in front of you. Um, and always, church, always remind them of the gospel that Jesus Christ has paid the full penalty for their sin. They also get to participate in the Lord's Supper later today, which symbolizes the things that they profess today. They also join in the church's responsibility the church's responsibility to spread the good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth. So church, help them in that task. So communicants, I'm going to read to you the five membership questions, and then I'll pray for you, and I'll ask you to stay up here um, after this. All right, communicants, I'm going to ask you the question, and if you do agree, you can say, I do. Do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God justly deserving his displeasure, and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy. Do you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners, and do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Do you? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? Do you? Do you promise to support the church and its worship and work to the best of your ability? Do you? I do. 
Do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? Do you? All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for these, uh, these guys and girls joining the church. I pray that this church and every church that they join in the future would serve to remind them that there is no condemnation in Christ, that they are at peace with you. Lord, we pray that they would grow up into the maturity of Christ through your church. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, I'll ask you all to stay up here. We also are going to do a baptism this morning. So, Ava Montgomery, I'll have you join me over here. So, Ava Montgomery has not been baptized before, and um, so we're going to baptize. You can just come right here. We're going to baptize her. Um, you know, baptism is a sign and a seal. That's, that's the language that we use. It's a sign because it signifies some greater reality, some truth. What it signifies is our need to be washed of our sin. And when we baptize, we baptize uh, infants or babies, uh, just like all these, these kids up here have been baptized before, we baptize them in hopes that that reality would come true for them, that their sin would be washed away by the blood of Christ. Well, this morning we get to baptize Ava Montgomery, not that the hope, in future hopes that that would be true, but because it is true that she has put her faith in Jesus and her sin has been washed clean by the blood of Christ. So baptism is a sign, but it's also a seal. Back in the old days when, I guess, kings were around, um, the kings would have a special signet ring. When they would send a letter, they would put wax on the letter to seal it, and they would put their special stamp, their personalized stamp, on the letter to show everybody that came into contact with that letter that that was the king's letter. Well, baptism is a special personalized stamp on God's people showing that these are God's people. So this morning, Ava Montgomery is having God's personal stamp put on her. So Ava Montgomery, your your identity is not in your your grades, it's not in your athleticism, it's not in your looks, it's not what you're good at, it's not in your family. The core of who you are is God's child. You are a child of the King. So Ava Montgomery, you have already answered the five membership questions. I'll let you hold that. So let's go ahead and baptize you. Ava Montgomery Cross, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Ava Montgomery. Thank you that what is symbolized here is true of her. She has been washed clean of her sin, that her guilt is taken away. Lord, I pray that she would always remember that that you have marked her, that she is your child. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Y'all can be seated. Here you go. Do you want this? Good morning. Uh, Just wanted to remind everyone that you have an opportunity to give here uh, through passing the plates. We also have baskets in the back of the church, but we also have opportunities through um, our church center app 
Um, also, for visitors, we do have a, uh, cards in front of the pew. Uh, please fill those out and, and drop them in the offering or the basket. Bow your head. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this day that we can come here and worship you. We thank you for getting to be a part of new communing members and a baptism. We've been blessed in so many ways, Lord, and please just let us uh, give back a portion of what we've been blessed with. And then we pray. Amen. Good morning. Those three and four-year-olds are now uh, dismissed for Children's Church who want to attend. Uh, you'll go through these double doors over here, and after the sermon, uh, parents, you can pick your children up. Uh, my name is Heath Weatherall, and I'm one of your uh, elders here at Christ Prez. And this morning, I have the privilege of uh, lifting us all up um, in prayer. So let's, uh, let's all go before the Lord now in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we all now come uh, before a holy God, uh, we are thankful to also be able to call you our Father, a Father who pours out his love to his children unconditionally. 
it causes us and the heavenly beings to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Father, on this, uh, on this first day of May, uh, we see the, the new blooms of spring, and uh, it just reminds us that you are making all things new and that our pains and our sufferings are, are only temporary. Father, uh, even if those pains are um, studying for final exams, Father, so we, uh, we lift up our students um, to you that are um, studying and that are about to graduate. Father, that you would just give them clarity, uh, help them remember the things that they've learned. Uh, give them peace, give them comfort, and uh, help them in times of uh, anxiety and worry. Father, we just praise you uh, for, this, for this truth and, and this promise. Every day we need to be reminded of your great promises. So Father, help us. Um, help us in a way that we would not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Lord, we, we also thank you uh, for this body and how you continue to grow your church, uh, not just at Christ's prayers, but all over the world. We thank you, Father, for those, um, those missionaries like Hunter Brewer, a church planner in Collierville, and Mike Weinbrenner, a church planner in Horn Lake. Father, would you, would you give them so much wisdom, um, just wisdom in raising up leaders among them, and give them a clear direction on raising up a body of believers? Lord, we pray now um, for Kurt and Kathy Presley and Mary Eva Presley, our members of the week. Father, we, we are so grateful for this family and how you use them uh, to care for this body. Just the, uh, just the will and desire that you've given them to love us, to love on us, to shepherd us. Father, so as a church, we are so thankful. Kurt asked for, for prayers and serving and loving his parents well. Um, would you give them both um, this desire and wisdom and how to do it well? Father, would you, would you also continue to teach them how to parent um, adult children uh, just in a way that continues to build their love for each other and for Christ? We pray the same wisdom for them as grandparents and lift up to you their grandbaby Felker uh, due to be born in July. We just, uh, we pray for continued health and for good checkups for these last few months. Lastly, Father, we pray that, uh, that you would continue to grow them uh, in their marriage in fresh love for Jesus and for each other. Lord, we also lift up to you, uh, Mary Eva, would you just bless her, Father, with such a rich contentment in her love for Jesus and just a joy that passes all understanding. Would you give her just a, a clear direction and fill her life with meaning and purpose? Father, we also pray for our Sunday School Teachers of the Week, Mita and Micah Ginn, Jay Dubard and Bill Dabney. We pray, Lord, that this would just be such a sweet time, uh, a time that that really reflects, um, as we've seen this morning, just the learning to live as becomes the followers of Christ. We also, uh, Father, just can't help but to give you praise for the birth of Webb and Tiffany Lewis's little girl, Ella Jane Lewis. Father, it just uh, it makes us sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Father, um, our hearts are also full, really, just from the sight of all these covenant children um, and just them standing up here and just giving their hearts in Christ and their testimonies to the church. Father, we praise you. Um, our hearts are full, and we thank you. Father, for our staff members of the week, Toby and Patty Griggs, we just thank you for such a rich and long ministry among this body and just the way that they have taught and loved on our children and how they've just taught um, the gospel. Lastly, Lord, we pray now for less that uh, just the power of the Holy Spirit would work in and through him and his preaching.
Father, we, uh, we lift all these things up to you, and we ask it in the Lord Jesus Christ's name, who taught us and our disciples to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 8. Um, this will be in page 944 of your Hugh Bibles. If you want to turn and follow along, we'll be reading verses 29 or 28 through 39. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus, the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation would be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God. You're familiar with the expression, I have a pit in my stomach? For whatever reason, growing up, I always thought that was referring to something like a, like a peach pit or something, which, of course, makes no sense when you think about it in terms of the expression. So I did some research, and it turns out the expression comes from a 17th century uh, expression, meaning a pit like a ditch or a void. And I think whenever you read it that way, the expression means a whole lot more. Because the reason why I was doing this research is I wanted to examine the circumstances when I would use the expression, I have a pit in my stomach. And I came across some examples that I thought might be relevant to some of you. Let's imagine that you go into work tomorrow and you stroll past the boss's office and you see a coworker getting chummy with the boss. Well, you and your coworker actually are in competition for a big promotion that you want really badly. And there he is chatting it up with the boss. Suddenly you get a pit in your stomach, right? Or let's say you're flipping through Facebook or Instagram and you see an acquaintance of yours who's celebrating the latest scholarship that their child got to a big school. And while you're trying really hard to rejoice with your friend and their good fortune, little thought pops into your head is, maybe I should have pushed my child to study a little bit more. The pit returns. Or let's say you get invited to a friend's party that they want to have at their brand new house. And as you pull up into the driveway, you honestly cannot believe how big the house is. And you look over at your spouse and wonder if they might be secretly wishing that they had ended up with someone quite as successful as your friends. There's that pit again. What are those sensations, right? What are those feelings? They're feelings of inadequacy. They're feelings of a, of a creeping insecurity that's born of fear that whoever I am is not enough. What I've done is not enough. I'm failing at life, we think. And that realization causes anxiety that is oftentimes so palpable that it produces this fluttering in our stomachs. We sometimes call those butterflies. 
But I kind of, I've come to enjoy the word pit a little bit more because that's what it feels like. It feels like in those moments that we've fallen into a void that has emptiness in the center of it. And it makes me anxious. I, I think there's actually a case to be made that much of the business of our days as Oxfordians is spent managing those feelings of feeling insecure and trying to keep them at bay. And they keep us miserable oftentimes, which we don't really recognize until we start to look at our bad habits, do we? I, I don't think I'm making any headlines when I say that probably in Oxford we drink too much. No, we're not one of those churches that believes that alcohol is inherently evil, of course. But for some of us, we just didn't pay that much attention to a really bad habit that started when we were students here. And over time, it really became a legitimate problem. I used to contend with students that the unique property that alcohol plays in your life is to sort of lower your inhibitions, which I think suggests that if for whatever reason I can't be in a social setting without something to drink, doesn't that suggest that the rest of the time when I'm not drinking, I am severely inhibited? The word we should be using there is insecurity because that's how you become an alcoholic. The drinks make life manageable. <laughs> that is, they're trying to fill up the pit long enough until you're finally saying things like, man, I need a drink. And by the way, we probably should never drink when we think we should need a drink, right? But my point is this morning is that our insecurities are driving so much of our waking life. The question is, though, how can we navigate those insecurities and live a life of joy and confidence? Here in Romans 8, 37 through 39, you get this glimpse of what really has to be some of the most secure, uh, convinced poise that the Apostle Paul has ever disclosed from his inner world. In other words, Paul is not preaching, as we've been saying, a commonplace Christianity. Rather, he is filling up that pit in his stomach with the great thought of God's word in his life. In other words, he's leading his readers into the convinced life, the one that we need to look at closely if we're ever going to get close to having the life that he had. Three things that Paul fills his life up with. Number one, he fills it up with God's sovereignty. Number two, with God's efficiency. And then finally, with God's adequacy. Let's look at that first one, God's sovereignty. Verse 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Uh, this has got to be one of the most quoted verses in the Bible for people that are hurting, right? And you can see why. Paul is saying this simply, that simply and straightforward, for those people who love God and are called by him, everything in your life, even dare we say, especially the bad things are going to end up being good things. <laughs> your bad, if you're a Christian, will always turn to good, Paul is saying. Look, we got to unpack this in about three different ways. The first thing you got to notice is the qualifier, by the way. You just got to own this because the blessing of bad things turning to good is actually restricted to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We've got to be real careful not to turn this verse into the Bible's equivalent of a I don't know, a Peter Pan happy thought or some sort of power of positive thinking with Christian skin on it. Paul is saying no one who has not been united with Christ should have any confidence that their futures are going to end happily. And I realize that's kind of a stark way to put that. But if it's true, it's much better to face that fact head on from the outset, wouldn't you say? My suggestion for someone who's wrestling with that is to go back to Romans 1 through 3, get secure there before you start to draw any rest out of chapter 8. Second thought is, we've got to be careful not to misread what Paul is saying. He's not saying, well, Christians just have good things happen to them over and over and over because all things work together for good. It's actually an entire strain of American Christianity that teaches this very thing. Come to Jesus and get a better life is the promise. But that's not what Paul was talking about here. In verse 29, he says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. But you'll find as you read on that that foreknowledge and that predestination has a reason behind him, an end, a telos, if you will. Namely, it says, to be conformed to the image of his Son. So that's not a promise that God fixes our circumstances in life to our desire. The promise is that God is going to finish what he started. In other words, God is not going to give up on his people 
until he has them happy and holy and with him. The promise is for a holy life, not an easy life, and we don't need to associate godliness with ease. As a matter of fact, the Bible often promises quite the opposite. But the third thing is, and this is what the main part of this point is, don't miss the joy of the doctrine of the sovereignty of God in your life. Paul is filling up this pit in his life by saying, it is God's practice to take everything in your life, including your pain and your heartache and your loneliness and your utter confusion and your deepest regrets. And it's not that he's going to erase them, you know, give you some kind of amnesia about them. He's not going to deny them, act like, you know, that never happened. But nor is he also going to make you pay for them. How many people do you know who interpret the bad things that happen in their lives? It's like, well, I guess God's getting me for that one. I wonder what I did to deserve this. That's not how God deals with our suffering. God deals with our suffering in much the same way that he did with his son's death on the cross. I used to love to ask students the question. Here's a question. Was Jesus dying on the cross? Was that the worst thing that ever happened in human history? Or was it the best thing that happened in human history? I mean, initially speaking, if you were his disciples, I mean, it had to look like a total catastrophe. I mean, here's a man who is literally changing the face of Palestine through the word of his power. Suddenly, though, he's captured and executed. I mean, if you were actually convinced that this was the Son of God, I mean, you would have been in the deepest of despair. But, of course, in the apostles, as the months went on, they began to realize that that very same cross, the lowest moment of their religious experience, ended up being the essence of the goodness of God to them and the greatest thing that could ever happen. And here's what I want you to hear. That is utterly unique to Christianity. No other world religion gets close to this. There are religions in the world, on the one hand, who look at you and make you feel guilty for your suffering. Well, I don't know. What what did you do wrong? Are you living the way you're supposed to live? There are other religions that will look at your suffering and say, well, that suffering's not real. That's an illusion. Eastern religions sort of find their way into that particular uh, emphasis. But it's only Christianity that comes along and says, yes, that was hard. That was awful. And you are completely justified to be crushed by it. But because Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, that worst thing in your life, you can actually have confidence that he's going to do the same thing with that and turn it into the best thing. What, meanwhile, the event being exactly the same. This is what it reminded me of. It reminded me of that story in Genesis 50, at the end of the story, where Joseph is there with his brothers. And his brothers are panicked. They all have a pit in their stomach. You want to know why? Because they have believed that all this time, their little brother, who they sold into slavery, was only being nice to them because their father was still alive. But their father's now dead. And so they're like, well, now he's going to kill us after it's all over. But here's the deal. Joseph is wrong. They're wrong about what Joseph's thinking is. Because Joseph's confidence is not in his circumstances, but in God's promise. And so he utters this beautiful verse in Genesis 50, uh, verse 20, when he says this. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are this day. Did you hear that? (laughs) You intended something. You had an intention for an action that was evil, but God superintended good from the exact same act. And I realize for some of you that sounds harsh because you're saying, I cannot imagine how God could possibly bring something good out of what I'm going through right now in the situation I'm in. But you can at least take some comfort in knowing that God is the kind of God who takes those very circumstances, and this is what will blow your mind, even the circumstances that had your evil intention behind them, And he takes those things and he fashions them for good so that he can bring about opportunities for all of his holy purposes for you. That's confidence. Like I'm old enough to say that there are eras in my my life that I look back and would not relive for all the tea in China. But I've also been a distance enough from him to look back and be like, but you know what? I don't think I'd trade him either because of how much God's taught me through it. 
That's different. And what happens is when we start to take that in, it begins to erode your insecurity from the inside because we fill ourselves up with God's sovereign control over my life. Secondly, though, we not only see God's sovereignty, but we see God's efficiency. What do I mean by that? Well, the second thing Paul encourages us with is by saying, not only is God going to take your bad and turn it to good, that good can never be taken away from you. Look at verse 29 and 30. What you get there is the first recorded, what we refer to as the order of salvation. There are a couple other places in the Bible, but Paul is simply saying, here's where your salvation began, here's where your salvation is headed, and here are all the logical steps in between. And he's saying, I think at least two really astounding things because of these, this order of salvation. The first one is this. Paul says, your salvation was thought about long before you ever thought about it. Look at verse 29. For those whom he foreknew. That's a very interesting word, foreknew. There's a lot of people who have read that word and made the mistake of thinking that to foreknow something just means that God had some level of intellectual awareness of something that was coming in the future. That is, God was looking down throughout the corridors of time, and he saw there that you were believing in him. The problem is that really doesn't do justice to the word foreknew, because the word's a whole lot stronger than that. Look, in the Bible, when it says to know someone, it's not just an intellectual awareness. It is actually a deep, personal, very intimate kind of knowing so much so, just by way of example, oftentimes you'll see the word no in the Bible as, as a synonym for people having sex. Go back to Genesis 4, 1, where it says, now Adam knew his wife Eve, right? Paul uses the exact same word here. In other words, Paul is not saying God was simply aware of you before you were born. He says he set his love on you. He determined to love you even before you or anything else was even created, which is why he can use that word predestined. It's interesting. That's actually a fairly uh, literal uh, translation of that Greek word that says God set a destination for us beforehand that we should be conformed to his likeness. Now, I know I'm not naive. This is where people get really bent out of shape. But I feel like in so doing, we oftentimes miss the beauty here. Because the beauty is simply this. I think that the more that you look inside your own heart, you're going to find a desire that wishes someone would love you for no other reason than the fact that they chose to love you. In other words, in our humanity, everyone longs for a love that is its own rationale. I don't want someone to love me because I did something for me. Because that means if it was, that it was earned. And if that love was earned, you know what that means? It means I can unearn it. And I think that's where the matters of insecurity lie when it comes to love. A number of years ago, I was talking to a campus minister friend of mine who had an adopted uh, 10-year-old child who found himself very upset one particular day because, you know, well, I'm not like your real children, mommy and daddy. My campus minister said, said something I thought was fairly clever. He said, well, look, you know, your brother and sister that we have, um, you know, we, when we had them, we had to accept whatever we got. But you, we chose out of everybody else. He said, suddenly the questions kind of dissolved and went away. Why? Because in that moment, the child grasped in the simplest of way that I was loved simply because I was loved. And he knew in that moment, here's the word, that he was secure because his place in the family, his standing in the family was not rooted in his performance, but rather in his parents' choice. That's where the encouragement comes from. Look, the child was upset, right? He struggled with where he was. He struggled with what, was no, what, he, what he knew on the inside. But at the heart of what his family was trying to say is, Dis, dislodge your confidence from your work. Put it in us. That is what the doctrine of election means. And I realize that's not going to satisfy some of your philosophical objections to those who don't like this teaching from the Bible. I can say this, that even when you reject the teaching, the desire to be loved in that way, with a love that is its own rationale, that's not going away, regardless of what happens. 
That's the first thing. Second thing, very briefly, is this that comes from this, uh, this second point about efficiency is in verse 30. Because Paul says, look, those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, get the language here. Justification is that thing that was done at the outset of one's salvation. It begins there. Glorification is that thing that's done in eternity future. When God has all of his people up in heaven and gives us new bodies and a new creation and everything else, that's the glorification. <laughs> but did you notice something weird about how that read? You would think it would say, those whom he justified, he will eventually glorify, right? <laughs> but the deal is, verse 30, that verb is in the past tense. And commentators have been noticing that grammar for years. Your future, Paul says, is so certain that we can talk about it as if it's already happened. This is the reason why I named this point God's efficiency. God has shown efficiency in saving his people. He didn't and he won't leave anything undone. Your future is certain in Christ. I think about this a lot. I look back in my youth, especially my dating times, and I realize of all of the idiotic decisions that I made during that epoch of my life, I often have found myself saying, you know, if I would have known that Ginger, the wonderful Ginger, was at the end of my search or at the end of my dating experience, I feel like I would have acted a little differently. But you can never know that, can you? You never know that there's someone lovely in your future that's going to happen. But what Paul is saying is, God doesn't treat us that way. God is going to say, I'm going to show you exactly what you're in for. So that by showing you the glory of your future, it begins to work into you and neutralize the insecurity that we feel about all of the circumstances that swirl around us. What's happening? Where am I going? What am I doing? Why did that happen? God looks and implants this efficiency inside of his uh, salvation. So God's sovereignty, God's efficiency. Lastly, Paul revels in God's adequacy. Man, look, in verses 31 to 35, if you can't tell, Paul is, Paul is verbally gushing. And what he does, he starts to lay out five reasons, at least five reasons, that we can feel a sense of security in our relationship with God. Or why God is fully adequate to provide for the worst of our insecurities. Look, it's a rapid fire wash of encouragement that he's drawn from, each of which I'm sure could be a sermon on their own. But it all adds up to this. It says that for the believer... Everything that you're experiencing now is going to get better and better and better. Look, just let some of this wash over you. First thing in verse 31, Paul goes to God's power. For if God is for us, who could be against us? I think that we white Protestants never focus on God's power enough, and that's probably because we've not done the hard work to figure out exactly what power means for a Christian. Hold that thought. We may return to that in the fall. But suffice to say, if you have God on your side, Paul is saying, you always have the bigger stick. Speak softly and carry a big stick, right? That was uh, our translation of what Jesus is saying in Matthew 10, 16, where we're supposed to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. We have the power of God behind us. It changes the way we look at power in general. But secondly, though, Paul really focuses on God's generosity. Man, I love verse 32. Look at it again. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? I <laughs> love this. Imagine an illustration. Let's say, for instance, that you have a relative who adores you. They adore you so much that they decide that they are going to purchase for you a condo on the square. I mean, premium real estate for you, right? And so you're there with your, with your relative at the closing and the realtor's there with you, walking you through the process as wonderful realtors do. And at one point the realtor says, you know, I think this is such a wonderful gift. Would you allow me to maybe put a nice wreath with a flower, maybe a ribbon on it to kind of decorate up the gift? And your relative looks at the realtor and says, okay, uh, how much is that going to cost? The realtor's like, well, I don't know, five, 10 bucks or something like that. Nothing big. What would you say if that realtor looks at you and is kind of like, $10? That's outrageous. I will not pay it. You would think to yourself, but you already bought a condo on the square. Why are you fussing over that? <laughs> Look, that is exactly how Paul wants you to reason in your heart. 
What is it that seeps into our hearts and has convinced us that God has suddenly become withholding? That, that somehow God is exasperated with my prayers? That he's somehow exhausted from helping me time and time again? Because Paul is saying, if he's already done the, the, the unbelievable thing of giving his son, how would, he not with, how would he withhold anything that you need after doing that? It's powerful logic, is it not? Thirdly, Paul looks at God's pardon in verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against any elect? Who I love this. Because how many times in the Christian life is it marked by feeling utterly chargeable? You know what I'm talking about? You've got the idea of grace somewhere in your thinking, but all of a sudden new evidence arises. I didn't know I was capable of that. And with that new evidence, we suddenly feel like maybe I'm on the outs now. Maybe the, maybe the judgment's going to be overturned. But of course, this is the beauty. Because in God's eyes, there's no such thing as new evidence. <laughs> because God knows all things and he justified us. That justification was including sins past, sins present, and sin's future. Because justification means that God is going to look at our, uh, God, at his son's life record in replacement of our life record, which includes our future. Which therefore suddenly means that all of those things, though they are unknown to me, the things that are coming in my future, they are not unknown to him. And he's paid it all. No wonder that in verse 34, Paul goes fourthly to Christ's work. He says, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. What a great summary of the gospel. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. He intercedes for his people on behalf. You know, there's actually some traditions, some churches, right before we take the Lord's Supper, they recite that together. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ shall come again. Maybe we should think about that. Fifthly and finally, Paul finishes with Christ's love. He says in verse 37, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. How can you be more a conqueror, by the way? That doesn't make sense. And I love that because I have no idea what Paul's talking about, except that he's saying, whatever it is, it's going to be great because it's rooted in his love for us. Hey, look, I think it's worth this. Can we take a moment to just think about the arc of one's life? Here I am in my mid-50s, and people keep calling me middle-aged, and I seriously don't think they mean that I'm in the middle of my life, but whatever. But the season people have been telling me just kind of gets you thinking about the trajectory of my life. Where am I headed? How am I going to finish my earthly portion in this life? Because if I can answer that question with confidence, it changes that pit in my stomach, doesn't it? And if I have confidence now, it changes the way I look at everything. But here's the deal. If what Paul is saying is true, it means that no matter what path my life is taking, it's always going to get better. It's always going to get better. Where is all this heading? I, I realize this, that there's something unusual for our graduating seniors here this morning. This may be our last time to get together in the way in which we are. And I simply want you to know that if there was any deposit that Christ Presbyterian Church wanted to make in your life in the little small window of time that you've allowed us to have here at this church, it is that somewhere in the midst of it, you would have come through with the Apostle Paul's words when he says, for I am sure, I am certain that neither life nor death nor angels or rulers or things present or things to come or powers or heights or depths or anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's it. That was the one thing we wanted you to get. And no matter where it leads you, no matter how many question marks there are in your future, now, maybe that you're at the beginning you're at the beginning of a journey. I don't know where the Lord's taken me. Maybe you're at the very end and you're looking back over life, maybe with some regrets. doesn't matter. Paul wraps it all up in this beautiful thought. And it reminded me, and Kurt and I were talking about this just a couple weeks ago, of the last line in C.S. Lewis's The Last Battle, where he describes heaven this way. He says, all of the children's adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, 
which no one has ever read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. What if that was our future? Let's pray. The Lord Jesus, would you take us by the hand and lead us to that so that we might worship and take joy, that when we come to this table, it will not simply be a mere, a, 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 an action of habit, but a place where we commune with you because you've invited us here. Would you do that? For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I've not yet gotten over how profound it is when we see Jesus here at the end of his own earthly mission, gathering together with his disciples and facing absolute unknown in their future, not having any idea what's coming. And what he wants to do more than anything else in the world is to have a simple meal with his friends. I love that. And in many ways, that's exactly what we're doing here. Jesus invites us to come forward to a very simple meal because even they don't know what's awaiting them. They have no idea what's coming in their future, but he comes and has a meal with them as they do. Look, no matter where you're headed this summer, no matter where school has you coming or where you're going, there's always going to be a place where they're celebrating the supper because God's people always do this when they get together and remind themselves of all the truth that God has brought them into, of the convinced life. As we say often, it is our custom at this church to invite you forward to the head of each section. There'll be a couple of elders here to greet you. There'll be ushers that'll release you row by row. We form little semicircles up here while the elders will pass out the elements. After you've got the elements, we usually try to take them together while we're up here. He'll say something like the gifts of God for the people of God. and You can partake in that time. Once you're finished, you can exit out the opposite side. There's little trash receptacles to place your cups uh, if you need to do that. Um, oh, you know, one of the things I feel like I don't ever stress and say clearly enough is that this is not Christ's Prez's table. If you're a member in good standing of any Bible-believing church, uh, this is your table. Come for This is Jesus' table that you can come forward and partake. Um, I do want to say this. We do ask, it's our tradition at this church actually to hold your children from coming forward to take communion until they have made a profession of faith, much like what our communicants did this morning. Um, it may be that the elder may even ask you whether the child is communing or not uh, in the midst of that. We hope that it creates some questions, but by all means, bring your children forward. We love for them to ask great questions. And it may be that the elder wants to pray with them very briefly while they're up here as well. So in preparation for coming to the table, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would help us as we set these uh, elements apart from a common use to a holy use, uh, that we would dwell and commune with you and that we would fill up those pits in our stomach with literal food as we eat here, but also with a spiritual food that is your sufficiency, uh, that is your sovereignty, that is your, all of the things that you give us that Paul has just laid out for us. Would you grant that to us? For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and says to his disciples, take, eat. This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup and having given thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you.
Please join us in singing as we continue to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Yeah. 
It is always such a joy to see you, especially to our visitors. We're so grateful to have you uh, in town. Thanks for coming and being a part of our worship this morning. We especially want to say to our graduating seniors, we have loved having you be a part of our church family. And we always say the same thing. Please keep in touch. We'd love to hear where God leads you and what's coming in the future. Uh, but in the meantime, it seemed to me uh, that what we talked about in the sermon bore repeating. And so this is my benediction this, this, even this morning. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And all God's people said, amen. Go in peace.